Hello everyone and welcome to Metrology Matters, your source for insights and expertise on all things metrology from the experts at Zygo. I'm your host today, Tyler Kern. Thanks so much for joining me for this episode. Now today we're doing a deep dive on surface metrology with two subject matter experts. Today we're thrilled to welcome to the program Mark Mulberg. He's the president of Digital Metrology. Mark, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. And we're also joined today by Carl Musoff. He is a retired senior technical advisor from Cummins. Carl, thank you for joining us as well. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Tyler. Well, I'm thrilled to have both of you and your expertise on the show today, and I'm excited to dive into our topic. So let's start off here. Can you provide a little context on how companies or designers currently specify surface texture parameters for their parts? I think I'll hand that to Carl since he's been in that world deeply. Yes, that's... Uh... That's an interesting kind of question because there are a lot of different answers to that. A lot of ways that people have come up with specifications. Some pretty good, some not so good. Uh, the most common is if you already make or specify or have designed a component that's a similar function, similar environment, you just copy the old engineering drawing. Same parameters, same limits. If your environment is a little more demanding, you just chop the limits, which of course may or may not work. And it gives heartache and headaches to your supplier, but that is often what is done. Sometimes it works if you have a process that it, you are going to repeat that similar kind of process, um, then a parameter will very likely do the job the parameters you're used to. The, and, and these, I'll give these in sort of increasing levels of difficulty or challenge or resource requirements. The next one is draw on the capabilities, the knowledge of your other suppliers. For example, if you're going to design a shaft that has a whole O-ring mating to it, talk to the O-ring people. They have a ton of experience on if you use these parameters, our O-rings will live pretty well. So pull in that knowledge. Going up from there, um, sometimes in some cases you can do some modeling of the system. Uh, this does not work very well with roughness. Our modeling capabilities aren't really good enough to handle roughness well, but waviness is better and form can actually pretty good be pretty good if you're mating two hard components, for example, gears or bearings or camshaft kinds of things you can model those interfaces and come up with some pretty good estimates of profiles that will work. The, probably the most uh, demanding one, money-wise, time-wise, is to do testing. But it is also likely to be your best option if you can afford it. And that is, if you have a functional test that can reproduce the environment, the operating conditions of what your design, final design will go into, Put parts through that test, measure them beforehand, measure them afterwards, look at what fails, look at what works, what doesn't, and then select parameters that really can separate the functional parts from the non-functional, the ones that work well, the ones that may fail early. And that can take a lot of time, a lot of resources, but when you're done, you can have a set of parameters that you can be pretty comfortable with. Carl, in research, everybody goes to the latter. They think that the world is all tested and tried and true. In practice, how many of the specs are just carryovers? You know, is it 50%? Is it more? I would say more. Uh, based on the fact, for example, that the most common parameters for surface texture for roughness are RA and RZ, RZ. They are not very good for defining function. But they are used, I won't say everywhere, but almost everywhere you find RA and RZ. So they really say that's parameters people know they're used to. And so they put them on a drawing, whether or not it really works, whether it really defines the function or not. That's, that's kind of what I've run into is drawings are often just copied and pasted from a previous version. And there isn't knowledge that goes into the specification. Right. Um, I've had customers with tolerances from the 1960s and 1970s and processes have changed and they can't meet those limits or yep. if they did meet those limits the surface wouldn't work yes yes and yet the copy and paste and copy and paste of some handwritten note becomes the contract today 
Yes, yes. That, that's for sure. That's the way I've seen it as well. That's some fascinating context that, that you guys provided there. And I, I'm curious, how does the relationship of the specified surface texture parameters relate to the parts? So in other words, how do we know these parameters are the correct ones to use? And I think that speaks a little bit to, to Carl, what you're describing. For example, and, and every system is going to be different, of course. You have parts that need to function by how they feel, what they look like, how they wear, how they don't wear. Um, I think you can be comfortable that your parameters are reflecting what's happening, for example, by looking at them visually. If you look at, at a system where you have wear between one part and another, if you see bands or stripes on a surface, that's gonna be waviness. Your roughness, you're not gonna see stripes. The wavelength isn't big enough. But if you see stripes, you better have waviness parameters included in in your specification. Carl, you're you giving away my secrets here. Yes, I'm nobody, sorry. Nobody really, well, I say nobody, that's a broad brush, but very few people consider waviness. We right. look at drawings and there's size. How big is it? And there's roughness. How smooth is it? Yep. But your, your topic of waviness is huge. There are papers published, one from a colleague in the gasket industry who calls waviness the hidden killer. And yes. that's pretty cool. I mean, we could make a, you know, a mini series out of that, but your point of visually looking at it is, is really solid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's, there's some of the logic as well, isn't there? You mentioned gaskets. If you have a gasket sealing against liquids, it's likely if it leaks, it's probably not a roughness issue especially if the liquid is fairly high viscosity, you know, an oil or something like that. Um, if you have leakage, it takes some area for that fluid to pass through, which again, tells you something about waviness more than roughness. Sure thing. So, so. Um, yeah, to the, are the parameters the correct ones? Often they're not. Um, right. The parameters that we use are easy to measure right. and available. Right. But for example, if we're trying to control friction, we don't have a friction parameter. That's right. So we look at roughness. If yep. we're trying to control appearance, maybe on an electronic device, you'd like that, you know, that sexy finish on the back of a laptop or something. We don't have an appearance number. Mm -hmm. So we try to come up with a number that we can measure that sort of relates to it. Um, I think we're getting better with, um, parameters that describe features better. If we talk about leakage and things like that, mm -hmm. we are developing those numbers, but often we're measuring what's cheap, affordable, and traceable. Mm -hmm. we'll measure height because we can get a national standard for height, even though height doesn't matter to friction. Yes, yes. And I think you're often constrained too by knowledge, both for the designer and for the manufacturing side with the quality personnel sort of in between, you, you want to give the manufacturer something they understand, they have experience with, they, they know what lever to pull on their machine right. to adjust it, but yet at the end of the day, that may not define function. Right, it's some disconnect that's close enough to function that we can live with, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult when one part works and the other part doesn't, yes. even though they're both inside the tolerance limits. Yes. Because yes. the tolerance isn't function. The tolerance isn't friction. It isn't ceiling. It's yep. height. <laughs> yep. Yes, yes, yes. I think Mark has the beginnings of a very interesting Netflix series, Waviness, the Secret Killer. Um, <laughs> I have credit to Ed Witter of Federal Mogul for that one. So <laughs> shout out to Ed. You'll have to give him an executive producer credit for that. We will, uh, we will. Yeah, for that series. Um, so I guess the, the natural follow-up then is what if no parameter can describe the surface? So what options do designers or engineers have at that point? Mark, that's right back to you, I think. Uh, um, that's really the fun of metrology for me. Um, it's, it's not much fun to do the same old measurement the same old way to try to solve new problems. So for me, the um, exciting thing is when somebody says these, these two surfaces act differently, but I can't put a number to it. And that's the, the design, the 
the the other side of your brain for um, stimulus. And our options are really quite big. Just because a measuring system reports a value doesn't mean we can't use the same data to come up with different information. Um, if you were measuring a surface and it's this tall, well, I wanna know how wide it is also. So we can get additional information out of our gauges. And surfaces are amazing this way because there are any number of things that might matter about a surface. Mm. Um, to one person, they might care about how it reflects. Another person might care how it seals. Mm -hmm. Very different things. And it's, it's a matter of taking a million data points in a little square, for example, and saying, what do I wanna do with those today? Um, the United States, if you wanna ride your bicycle across it, what does that surface mean? Do you wanna go east or west? That's a surface question, and we can come up with ways of describing the surface in a way that makes sense to you riding your bicycle across the United States. I think um, in that regard, Carl and I have done quite a bit of work going outside that box. Um, Carl, you can speak to some of the functional examples where we didn't have a parameter to, to describe a failure. So right. parts were failing and costing companies lots and lots of money. And there was nothing in the instrument that was available to help us. Right. Yeah, I think of one being a hard contact, sort of a bearing kind of contact, a rolling element bearing. We have two hard bodies against each other, uh, very high stresses, uh, two gigapascals or higher kinds of stresses. And you occasionally we'll see a line of distress on a part, some, some a damage. A line of distress. That's sounds... A line of distress. Sorry. In my world, that actually means something. Um, <laughs> like little holes in the part, or even if the part, one part is just polished really heavily, you know that something is going on there. When you trace the parts, you find that there's a bump there. Um, not which of course, what's a bump? And that is the challenge. We know that a bump on a otherwise smooth surface can be a stress concentrator, but you can't put no bumps on a drawing. And so that's where Mark and I worked with, okay, things that matter are how high this bump is, but also how sharp. If it was very, very uh, gradual bump, it may not matter. If it's a fairly sharp, steep bump, that does matter. So by putting together those requirements and using some different filtering techniques, we came up with a parameter that we could relate to that failure. When we controlled the parts with that parameter, the failures went away. Hmm. And the so that was a good success story. Sorry, yeah, Mark. The interesting thing with that is even defining what is a bump. A yeah. bump in a road is different than a bump on the back of your hand. Yes. And uh, in our case, the bump occurred on the side of a hill. Yep. It wasn't even the top of the mountain. It was a little lump on the side of the mountain. And instruments don't have that. So to the question of if nothing can describe the surface, well, great. That's a, an exciting opportunity to develop something new. Mm -hmm. Which I think is where many or most of the surface texture parameters have come from, right? Need over the years. We yeah. have something. We don't have anything right now that describes it. Let's come up with something. Sure. Yeah. So I think "Line of Distress" can be Carl's sequel to Mark's series. On <laughs> it, 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 it is yeah. does not come close, though. <laughs> it is in a different category. Mark <laughs> that one. Lines of Distress by yes. Carl. Munson. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think it's a killer idea. Anyway, so as an engineer, how can I determine what I'm getting off the metrology system is useful? So what, what can I see in the data? Wow. Mark, you want to tackle that one? I don't. Uh, <laughs> because you can see so many things in the data. And really, truly, one of the most important things to learn is the ability to start to separate data from noise. Can I trust my measurement? And this is something, you know, that Carl and I have spent years and years doing is, is kind of the, the forensics of our data. 
when we look at a, a picture of a surface in three dimensions, are we seeing the surface or are we seeing noise in the measurement? Uh, it's like if you hear an audio signal, are you listening to static or music? And you start to develop those abilities. I met a doctor once and happened to have an x-ray of my hand in front of him and say, hey, take a look at this. You know, he's just a friend. And he said, oh, you got such and such bone broken at this angle at this thing. It's like he didn't even spend two seconds filtering through what was normal, what was irregular. And um, the same in surfaces many times there are irregularities that aren't real. So as an engineer, can I trust the data? That comes with a little practice. There are some easy tools that Carl and I use and promote. For example, if you measure a surface left to right, spin the surface around and measure it right to left and see if it's the same shape. Hmm. Um, measure slower, measure faster measure with different magnifications, mm -hmm. but start to try to separate the measurement from the surface. And in the realm of today's tolerances, it's very difficult sometimes because yeah. our instrument performance is right up against the limits of the surface we're trying to measure. Yep. And, and I think thinking about, I see these features in my measurement. Does that make sense for this surface? Um, and one example I think of is a lap surface. Mm -hmm. So you may grind something and then lap it with paper or stone to make it really smooth. If you think about the process, it shouldn't generate miscellaneous or random high peaks. Mm -hmm. If you measure that surface and get a lot of random high peaks, you are measuring something and it's not the surface. You're most likely measuring debris. You right. haven't cleaned that surface well enough before your measurement. Yeah. So that, that sort of logic is what I'm seeing and how this part was made. Do they really make sense together? Yeah. If, if you paved your driveway and you found a tree in the middle of it, that's not part of the paving process. Right. Right. <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't work that way. Good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> and I think one other thing, Mark, you mentioned about, can you believe what your instrument's telling you? And that brings up this whole question of uncertainty. Mm. Do you have noise or other factors coming into your equipment that is having an appreciable, a, a significant impact on your data? Um, and so there are methods to measure your uncertainty of your system. How much error can there be? How wrong can my answer be? Uh, and it seems those aren't often well understood or well applied either. Right. And so that's another area that people can become more familiar with. Yeah. In the, in the past two weeks, I've had conversations with customers where they've wanted their measurement to repeat. Yes. And this is with a stylus-based system, and that's a natural engineer reaction. I want repeatability, yep. but the most repeatable instruments are often the dead ones. Yep. And they are truly pushing themselves to prefer an, an instrument with bad fidelity. It just doesn't see things. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting stuff. So if there were advice to be given for producing specs for surface texture, what would it be? And, and same for metrology companies. What, what should they be aware of when measuring their customers' parts? <laughs> Mark? Um, <laughs> well, the, the, what would your advice be? That's like wide open. That's an exciting one. Um, <laughs> for me, so in other words, Carl, we can say anything here. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's uh, dangerous. It's dangerous and, and fun. Um, <laughs> my, my number one top of the heap advice I would give to anyone is you've got to look at your surface as a surface with a well-scaled profile graph, a you know, nice 3D rendering that you can move, not just a static picture, but the ability to spin your data around and see how features relate to each other is the most powerful tool we have. I often struggle when a, when a company will approach me and say, here's some data for our surfaces that aren't working. And they give me a list of numbers, not pictures, not data sets that I can look at. Yep. a column of RA, roughness values. Those numbers aren't descriptive. Um, an analogy I love to use is I could come home from a concert and tell you it was 105 decibels. 
but so is a fire truck. Mm -hmm. So the best advice is to go to the concert, <laughs> um, yeah. be there and listen to it. Or in the case of surfaces, the best advice I can give is to start with a picture. Yeah. Look at the surface, spin it around, scale it up, scale it down, then start filtering your way into the data to see which wavelengths are present, what shapes are present. Mm -hmm. and um, work our way in from a knowledge of function. How does this shape interact with another shape? Not what is my number? Right. And I think for the metrology companies, they can, they can add much more value when, when I approach you as a, an instrument company and say, I have this specification, can you measure it? They're already in a small box. If they come back with, we can measure it, and this is what your surface looks like that's value add. So being aware that surfaces are not numbers, surfaces are shapes and incorporating shape information into our conversation through graphs, plots, models, whatever is huge. It is the, the biggest benefit we can give people in our field. Um, quick anecdote, one company I work with started putting software on their engineer's desks to look at the, the surface data so they could filter it, they could scale it, they could process it instead of the laboratory doing the processing. They said that was the single biggest benefit they've had in engineering because they now understand surfaces and their shapes and what that means to function, not just looking at a number that might be good or bad. And Carl's been a great um, champion of this. He is a consummate data consumer. How's that for linguistics? <laughs> We're coming up with all kinds of one-liners here. <laughs> Tyler, um, you're keeping a list of all these, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have an extensive list. I'll put them in an Excel document when we're done. There you go. There you go. We need to trademark every one of them. Absolutely. Yes. But Carl, you've got more raw data on your computer than I think most humans. Yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot. And it can really be interesting to look at that. Uh, you've often talked during this, this um, discussion here about 3D data, which is wonderful if you can get it. Now, I think many of the people you interact with, I'm sure that I've interacted with, still are working with 2D data. But even that can be really useful, really informative to look at um, what, what does that profile tell you about its form, its waviness, its roughness? And on some surfaces, it's very adequate for that. If you have a turned surface, a 2D profile is going to give you a pretty good representation of that. There are some, of course, where 3D is really necessary. But, but that I can't, I don't think we can overemphasize this point of looking at your data. Don't look at the number. Use your eyes to look at what does this surface act? What is it, its appearance? What does it include? Well, I'm going to do another scary thing and open the floor up to you guys. And for any final thoughts, any final comments, uh, maybe anything we haven't touched on yet here on, the, uh, on, on this recording that you think would be good for people to hear, good for people to know. Um, so Carl, Mark, guys, take it away. Uh, anything else that, that you want to mention before we wrap things up today? Maybe I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I'm a metallurg metallurgical engineer by training. And so uh, in my career, when it started, I wanted, I had a hammer, so that was going to fix every problem, you know, the normal situation. And it does, metallurgy, I'm an absolute believer in it. The mic structure, the how a part is processed is essential. But many of the problems I had to address, I realized that the microstructure wasn't the problem. It wasn't the way to improve this product. It was what that surface was, how that surface was made, what it looked like, how it interacted with mating surfaces. So I just, th this discussion has been about surface texture and I'm a convert from being, I believe metallurgy is the way to solve the world's problems to now, I think surface texture is really, really critical for many situations to make improvements in that product. Yeah, and I think I would kind of wrap with a similar thought. If we look at the evolution of manufacturing, we started out controlling things with lengths and gauge blocks. And eventually we got into GD&T and coordinate systems and stack ups and fits and orientations. 
And today we're moving beyond that into what goes on within those stack ups and orientations into the surface texture, waviness, form, roughness, um, kinds of aspects of things. And that's where really the, the big improvements and also the big warranty challenges are taking place today. Yeah, um, sure. The world of tightening tolerances to the point where we have no lubrication film. Yep. The world of electric vehicles that are so quiet that we can hear every gear tooth mesh together. Um, <laughs> yep. We're in a realm in biomechanics where implants are being driven to last longer and longer with less debris and better friction properties. Um, we are in a generation where this is probably more important than ever, and we get to be talking about it today. Yes. Incredible stuff, guys. Carl Musoff and Mark Malberg. Thank you guys so much for joining us here on Metrology Matters today, sharing your expertise and your insights. I've had a blast. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Gentlemen, thank you once again. You're Thanks. welcome. Thanks. And everyone, thank you for joining us for this episode of Metrology Matters. Stay tuned for more content from the experts at Zygo. We'll have more podcasts, videos, and other content for you to consume coming to you shortly. But until then, I've been your host today, Tyler Kern. Thanks for watching.